so um, what I want to talk about this morning was prompted, initiated by <coughs> um, somebody who put on Facebook a quote from a very famous Zen teacher called Kodo Sawaki. And um, he made some lots of quotes during his life, which have been translated into English and French. And uh, people like to quote him because he said some very short and wise sounding statements. And one of the things that he said, which people like to quote, is uh, Zazen is good for nothing. <laughs> <laughs> you can't get anything from Zazen. Of course, um, this quotation is passed around in books and the internet, um, but people don't know who he was speaking to or, or what the situation was. But anyway, they like to quote, Zazen is good for nothing. And it's become a, a little bit of a kind of, oh, Zazen is good for nothing. Like we're proud of Zazen is good for nothing in Zen because Zen already has an image of being uh, a practice that doesn't value the intellect so much. Zazen is good for nothing. You can't get anything. So that made me realise that many people misunderstand what he said because he didn't say it in English or French or Czech. He said it in Japanese. And the languages are very different. And he said it to an audience of Japanese people. And uh, <clears throat> at that time in Japan, um, people were struggling between the First War and the Second War. <coughs> and they were looking for something. And especially in religion, they were looking to get some result. And um, unfortunately, um, the teachings in Buddhism in Japan became much weaker in the middle of the 1800s, about 1850, 1860. Um, and from then they got even weaker because the Zen teachers in Japan who were teaching in 18, early 1800s uh, understood what the teachings meant. But after Japan opened up to Western countries, Japan became very keen to accept Western ideas. And when they saw beautiful churches in Europe and they heard about Christianity and heaven, they, they wanted the um, same thing. And this affected uh, Buddhism a lot. In fact, towards the end of the 1800s, the government tried to destroy uh, a lot of Buddhist uh, t temples and they wanted the Buddhist teachings to be nice and um, ordered so that uh, they kind of when Western people saw Buddhism, they could understand very logically and clearly. So they tried to rationalize the teachings. And in that rationalization, it became very common for people 
to believe that practicing Zazen, Buddhist way of practice, was a path towards a special, beautiful, peaceful state called enlightenment. So most people in Japan at that time thought that uh, priests living in temples and people studying Buddhism were trying to get something. So Kodo Sawaki, who is quite um, straight, very straightforward, direct teacher, said very loudly to his audiences, you can't get anything from Zazen. It's not good for anything. So he was trying to tell them that their understanding, <coughs> general understanding, wasn't correct. But I would like to say that if we practice, I can only talk about Zazen because I never practiced anything other than Zazen. I don't mind if it's got a different name, but if we practice the practice which is called Zazen, then um, of course we get result. Everything has a result. And if we practice regularly for some years, um, we can get some result, some effect. And um, I'd like to talk about four different effects we can get if we practice Zazen regularly, for instance, every day or every couple of days, for some time, like um, 10 years or 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> And um, I wrote them down. Um, the first, first thing is we can get the ability to evaluate what is valuable and realistic from the huge amount of teachings we can find everywhere in the West now on the internet, in books, from teachers, YouTube, blah, 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 blah. It's everywhere. And the most important thing is how can we judge those teachings? Um, of course, we can say, oh, I don't need to judge any of them. That's fine. But... Um, if we want to uh, evaluate or judge which of the teachings are, uh, uh, which teachings are realistic or valuable, then practicing zazen gives us the ability to do this because we are comparing the teachings that we read about or hear or listen to with our own real experience. So it gives us a basis to make an evaluation or a judge. I don't mean that we have to be, this is right, this is wrong. Not that kind of judgment, but yeah, that sounds reasonable. That sounds helpful. That sounds true. Or, Ah, that sounds a bit weird. And if you don't do this, then you can spend your whole life looking at all these huge amount of teachings, which in itself may be valuable if you want to do it. So the first effect of practicing Zazen regularly for some time is we, we have the ability 
to evaluate teachings. The second effect we can get is a healthy body. If we sit regularly in uh, the simple posture of Zazen, uh, it's a simple thing. In, in Japanese there's the phrase Shikantaza, which means just sitting. So the practice of Zazen is very simple. It doesn't have uh, many other aspects that uh, other kinds of meditation may have. It's a simple postural sitting. But in that simple sitting, we can uh, find a physical balance between all our bodies systems and that's the basis of our long-term health and medical science is supporting that the way we treat our body and how we sit and how we walk does affect our health The, um, the third effect is uh, we gain the ability to be in the present moment. So we're not trapped by the past and we're not pulled into the future. course it's impossible to live without being trapped by the past and pulled into the future um, that's to be human to remember the past and to look forward or to be f frightened of the future but um, if we practice Zazen regularly we, we it doesn't trap us so we may spend one morning or even a whole day trapped in the past, but we can, we can escape into the present. And the reason we can escape into the present is because that's what the practice of Zazen is. Constantly getting back to the present, to where we are, sitting. And the fourth effect of practicing Zazen regularly for some time is that we start to lead a life that is not based on our ideas. It's not led, our life is not led by our ideas. Instead, it's led by acting in the real world. Uh, if we think about it, we can agree that what we do now, in fact, creates the future. Even if I pick up my coffee, I have one future. If I don't pick up my coffee, maybe a different future. And if I talk about picking up my coffee, maybe another future. Every act in every moment creates the future. We can understand it here, but actually it's real. And by practicing Zazen regularly over a long time, our life becomes based on what we're doing now. And that's called the Buddhist way. Uh, it's also called the middle way uh, in traditional Buddhism. In um, the teachings that I studied, um, 
the 13th century teacher Dogen used the word balance again and again and again in his writings and um, the middle way is the way of balance we can say that uh, balance is another word for being in the middle between two extremes so to lead a life in the real world is to lead a balanced life and to lead a balanced life we practice sitting in balance So, what do you think about some of the um, teachings you see on, in books and on the internet and YouTube and so on? When I listen to some of them, and I don't read very much, but when I read, hear about people who read some things, I can find some things which are exactly the same as the teachings of Zen in words exactly the same and I can find other teachings which to me sound ah I can't believe that <laughs> No, I can't believe that. So, how do we judge these teachings? Well, I can give you four ways to judge them. Always four. One is, for me this is, are they logical? If the teachings are not logical, we can't understand them clearly. Of course we can still believe in them even the teaching says God's come down in the night and uh, rearrange the world how they want it <laughs> you can say okay <laughs> <laughs> but it's not logical so it's mm. difficult to believe it for <laughs> logical people mm -hmm. Um, so logic is a good way to evaluate anything um, in medi medieval times uh, people didn't use logic to evaluate things mm. so they had beliefs like God is uh, making us move with strings like a puppet mm -hmm. or um when you get a virus, it comes from the bubbles in the water. So when you when you have a bubble on the top of the water, it bursts and the virus comes out. Mm -hmm. Lots and lots of beliefs like this. And we don't believe them any longer, usually, because <laughs> first of all, they're not logical. But secondly, they're not scientific. So the second criterion I would recommend is do the teachings agree with science um, I don't mean they have to be the same as science but do they support science because if they don't support science it may be they the teachings know something that science didn't find out yet that's a possibility mm. On the other hand, science is, of course, science goes this way and that way. There are some theories which are wrong and some, but overall, over some years, science has a very powerful method to make sure things are true or not by verifying them in the real world experiment so we should rely on science 
So we can say, does do the teachings support what <laughs> science has found? Doesn't have to be the same, but does it support what science has found? Is a good criterion. Um, the, the third criterion we can say in evaluating is do the teachings talk about the present moment? Um, because it's a very simple con concept, it's a very simple thing. The present moment people are slowly realising that actually everything happens here. Um, and many of the real people who have realised this fact are sports people. Sport is a very powerful way to experience the present moment. And there are many different practices where we have to concentrate on what we're doing. Uh, yoga, uh, even playing music. So all these kind of activities point to what we're doing now, concentrating on the present. So the third criterion for evaluating a teaching could be, does it talk about the present in any way? <clears throat> and um, the fourth criterion I would like to suggest is, are the teachings profound? Do you know the word profound? Mm -hmm. That, that means, do they include everything? Are they, are they inclusive? Are they deep? Is there room for everything in those teachings? Um, if a teaching, for example, says, if you must join our group and believe what we believe, and if you don't, then you're going to die. Everybody in the world is going to die. <laughs> so we can say that teaching is not profound, <laughs> it's not inclusive. So um, I, I, don't, I can't believe in it. <laughs> so four criteria. Is the teaching logical? Does the teaching support science? Does it talk about the present moment? what we're doing now and is it profound <coughs> and um, it sounds a little bit an analytical to have four categories and so on but uh, it's quite a useful general way to have in the back of your brain when you're reading or listening to other teachings. So I hope other people evaluate my teachings from these four criteria. And if I don't pass the criteria, you can leave. <laughs> After lunch. <laughs> So, um, tomorrow I want to talk about the um, healthy body and the physical aspects of Zazen. And then um, on Saturday, tomorrow's Friday. No, Saturday. Saturday, 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 Saturday yeah. And then on Sunday I uh, want to talk about um, the um, uh, present, being in the present moment. So, that's it. <laughs>
<laughs> That's what I want to say this morning. So let, let's um, talk about it. Um, <coughs> I'm I'm quite. Um, as some of you know, up to maybe five, six years ago, I only studied with my teacher. And uh, I only studied the teachings of uh, Zen Master Dogen. But I studied them every day for 30 years. And um, so I know them um, very uh, completely. But I knew nothing about other kinds of teachings. Um, so I started learning uh, five or six years ago what other people are saying. And when I look and see what other people are saying, I, I always have to kind of... Hmm. Challenging. It's challenging. It's challenging, yeah. Um, but it's it's for me it's been like opening my eyes to hear, for instance, um, Eckhart Tolle, who I think you told me about years ago, and then Miriam told me about again, and then I listened to him. Oh, right, he's saying the same thing. But if you'd asked me ten years ago. I would not have been interested. <laughs> right? Yeah. Right. <laughs> uh, because I didn't know. And um, there are many other uh, teachers. In fact, um, these days there are many gurus. Um, I'll give you my definition of a guru. Um, a guru is... Um, um, a person, a human being, who um, wants to find an audience of people to listen to them, and then they find an audience of people who want to listen to them, and so the guru becomes very happy <coughs> to find the people who want to listen to them and the people become very happy to find a guru they can listen to. So um, there can be great happiness. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't criticise that happiness. But um, um, all the teachers that I've been uh, associated with we're not like that. Um, my teacher used to say to me, if people want to listen, they can listen. If they want to go, they can go. Never stop somebody coming. Never stop somebody going. And he also said an organisation is not so important. If you have an organisation, you will have lots of problems, which is true. Um, organizations are formed of human beings and <laughs> human beings bump against each other and uh, they're competitive and uh, they have hundreds of problems so if you have an organization um, you can you can have lots of problems yeah, especially in check with organization Oh yeah, and yeah, and this comes down to Buddhism in general in Czech. Because oh, okay. A lot of little groups, mm -hmm. uh, which cut, which starts from maybe ten people, then fifteen people, and yeah. then it comes down to three people. <laughs> so <laughs> then, then, then we have a lot of organizations around Czech Republic, which comes down to like five people. Oh, okay. <laughs> each organization, and that's it. <laughs> oh, that's not an organization. And we don't have anything big. <laughs> oh, okay. Well. Um, I, I don't want to comment on the teachings of a guru, but um, I noticed the characteristic is the relationship between the guru and the students and how that creates happiness. 
um, for both parties. And sometimes, and um, I'm, this is just a fact, uh, that happiness means the people want to donate money. And sometimes there's a lot of money. And then um, the guru be can become rather both rich and famous, which is a very big problem <coughs> for anybody. To become rich and famous is not easy, I would guess. And I was watching um, a film, a documentary about um, Bhagwan Rajneesh, Osho. Mm -hmm. Rolls Royce. Mm -hmm. The Rolls Royce man. And um, if you read his teachings, they're w wonderful. So what went wrong? You know? Um, because uh, there were many, many, many very serious problems came out of his organization. But the people in the organization were in a, a group of happiness. And that, that kind of happiness is sometimes hypnotic. And then you think the guru is a god, and then, uh, or your father, or your mother, and so on. So, um, uh, there are many people now who can become gurus because of the, e the ease, it's very easy now to create a, a group to receive money, to make an organization, to sell videos, books, teachings, blah, 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 vroom. Um, but it's very, very difficult for a teacher to teach freely in that kind of situation. Um, if you're taking money from people for your teachings, you, you should say what they like to hear. <laughs> if you have to pay for the building from that money, then you better say what they want to hear. <laughs> Otherwise, you don't get the money for the building. And then, whoa. So, very difficult life. Can I ask, uh, how did uh, Nishiji Maroshi, your teacher, because he seemed to be quite successful having I don't know how many people followed him, but how did he avoid getting into that trap, that situation? Because he wasn't that kind of guru for, for you guys, right? Well, he wasn't a guru because he wasn't, he didn't make us happy. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, sometimes he upset us. I, I had big problems with him. <laughs> he had big problems with me. Not <laughs> avoiding conflicts, basically. So Guru tries to please everyone and the free teacher does not avoid conflicts. So well, tells... fir first of all, my teacher didn't want anything. Hmm. Uh, only one thing, he wanted to spread Zazen through the world. That's the only thing he wanted. Hmm. He didn't want to get lots of students, but he never refused anybody. Hmm. So it's a difference between an intentional creation and um, kind of more natural way so okay some people came to to listen to me so I'm going to hire a room and give talks every week okay some more people came uh, blah 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 so uh, my teacher's life was not intentionally created even the Zen center we had in Tokyo was a surprise to him. Um, one of his first students who was um, a, a Japanese businessman, quite wealthy businessman, said to him, oh, why don't you start uh, a place where people can, foreigners can come and stay? I give you the building, I pay the money. So he said, oh, okay, we try. So that's what we did. I don't know whether it was successful or not, but lots of people came.
came and went, came and went. Foreigners, I mean. Mm. So you can avoid it by not doing it. Not, so not planning anything. Well, well, don't intend to create some big organisation. Mm. If it happens, then you have to look at the situation. So don't intend to do it. Don't try to do it. Don't want to become famous. If you become famous because people listen to you, that's okay. Don't try to become famous. Don't try to become rich. Mm. And so on. Mm. So it's up to the teacher. I try not to create any any permanent group. I think you, it was you said some years ago. Dogen Sangha doesn't exist. <laughs> when when we get, come together, it exists, and then we go home, it disappears. So that's that's fine for me. So I don't, you know, I've I've watched some teachers on the internet, on YouTube. I can't visit them. And uh, I'm very interested just to see, hmm, does, does, what, what, what are they doing? What, what, what does it seem like they want? And um, how are they getting it? I don't want to do it, but it's very interesting to, want to uh, listen and see. And even in the Lotus Sutra, which is a very ancient sutra, it says the truth exists everywhere. So uh, that means everywhere, not only in Buddhism, not only in the Zen Buddhism or in some other kind of Tibetan Buddhism. Or in, everywhere means everywhere. But not everywhere is the truth. Not all teachings are teaching the same thing. So if, if your group is successful, that's great. If it not successful oh it's okay it doesn't matter so much of course you might feel sad but um, that's okay <laughs> uh, that's my attitude <laughs> 